Hi, my name is Eric. I am 26 years old and a sophomore at BYU. I love snowboarding. I love going out, doing stuff, uh, activities, physical activities, though I'm not a huge fan of sports. I love snowboarding. I love uh, doing just a ton of different games, a ton of different activities, just being active and enjoying life. Uh, don't really like, there aren't as too many dislikes, uh, some foods, but I love eating. Uh, but as far as dislikes go, probably the biggest dislike I have would be humid weather, especially uh, in the middle of the winter. So Utah is perfect for me. So as the oldest child, I really felt like there was a lot of responsibility with me. Um, I have three siblings, a younger brother and two younger sisters. My younger brother is 24 now, isn't he? Yeah, 24. I think he's turning 25 pretty soon. And then my younger, my younger sisters are 22, uh, 22 and, tw and 16. Coming up on 16, 15 right now. Uh, growing up with them was great, uh, but there were a lot of, obviously there were a lot of issues. As the oldest, as the oldest child, it's a very great experience to get to see them to see my siblings, but it's also kind of a stressful one. I always felt like there was that aspect of responsibility, feeling like I needed to help them, where th to help them do and become who they needed to be. And it was very hard to, to push that away, to live my own life or to do whatever, or to lose that guilt when I felt like something else was going wrong. My siblings were great people. They pushed along, but, and, but when they did things that I didn't necessarily agree with, it was kind of hard to put that distance up. I didn't really ever get past that until my mission, actually, which I'll t be talking about a little bit more in depth later, but uh, when my mission came around, I really had to come to terms with not being in control of my siblings uh, and not being in not being able to be, not being responsible for every single action they did. But it was definitely, being an elder, oldest sibling was definitely one of the best experiences of my life. I was in the charter school up through, I think until I was around 10, 11 years old. And then my, we were put in, pulled into high uh, homeschooling for the next six years, five, six years, and where and I'll go more into depth about that. But as a result, a lot of my social life, a lot of the people, my social connections weren't with, uh, I didn't have too many of them. Didn't really, I wasn't ever the type of person to go hanging around the neighborhood, uh, reaching out to other people. I was very much, I became more of an introvert, actually. I didn't really want to reach out to other people. It was too much effort. So I uh, played a lot of video games. I played a lot of, uh, messed around with the computer a lot, learned how it worked actually, which is one of the reasons why I'm going into my field now, uh, which is information systems, just for a bit of context. I really, it was a bit lonely. It was a bit rough, but I loved, um, I loved playing video games with it. Video games to me are, is an art. It's just something that you can use to express a medium, just like uh, a painting or a movie or a television show is used. Video games are also used to share a vision of the world that, or share an idea, a concept that the author would like. And I really felt that as I, over, as with my experience with video games, you, where most people are, a lot of people are critical of movies. I found myself critical of video games, comparing them, um, seeing how they work and seeing how they share, how strong they are in sharing their story and can gain the person connected with them. Uh, as such, I've grown a huge love of video games and really appreciate the, uh, that kind of art form, yeah. So as a kid, I uh, went to Boy Scouts. Uh, it was fun, a ton of fun, ton of fun. Uh, but we, I mean, we were, at first I was in Cub Scouts for a little bit, but then I went to Boy Scouts, and it was good. But it was very uh, hectic. How do I put it? My parents supported me in doing it, but it was very much a, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it. Not, we're not going to be the ones who are going to be pushing you along. You're going to be self-motivated. And a lot of times I sort of fell by the wayside. Um, I am an Eagle Scout, 
but and that's by the grace of a lot of people who are rooting for me and keeping me along through the final stretch. I love camping uh, because of being in, because of my experience with scouting and with um, with the program and with my young men's leaders and all of that because of how much how tied they are with each other. But I most of all I just enjoy being learning new things. Uh, as a scout, I learned a ton of different experience, had done a ton of different experiences, ton, learned a ton of new things that I wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, I was born and raised in Detroit or in the Detroit area, Michigan, and there's a lot of nature, but there's a lot of a lot more city, and we had to travel a bit to be able to go out camping to do these things to go on the 50 mile bike ride. We were in uh, a national park, but it offered a view into something I otherwise wouldn't have seen, where I could have just been all around technology all the time. If I didn't have the scouts, I was able to learn more about nature and the world around me and get a far more varied, a lot, far more built fun, a foundation. The homeschooling experience, um, what do I say about it? As I said uh, previously, it's, I started off in a charter school. Um, right up until I was maybe nine or 10. I had a lot of, the fo I had phonics, I could, sp I could spell, I could read. And I was doing a bit of, I, mean, I was doing a bit of ahead of my grade, but we, um, because of a couple of complications that, and my la dad's, la my father's lack of, dis of trust in the school system at the time, especially in a place like Detroit, uh, he pulled us out and started putting us into public, uh, into homeschool. But what he did for that was not really standard. What we did was we had the, our curriculum was every day we would read the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was a set of encyclopedias, each one book for usually one letter of the alphabet. And there were, I think we had 20 books of the 1988 Encyclopedia Britannica. And what he wanted us to do was read it and then write an essay on what we read. Usually that took us around four or five hours don't know why it took so long. Now I can do that pretty quickly. But back then, it was, I mean, it was all handwriting, and we had to write one or two pages on that, and that was our assignments. Back then, for a little kid who was, 12, uh, who was 10, 11, 12, it was a nightmare. But we, it was great in that we could finish before 12, so I was able to play more video games. I was able to do whatever I wanted. But, and we learned to skirt around the rules when we were in a rush. But that was what we did. I got up to PQRS. I had a stack of around of so many papers, of so many essays, and we were able to study what I wanted um, in the way we wanted. So there was a lot of things that I didn't learn. I didn't learn maths too well. Uh, I love math, but uh, it took me until I went to high, um, into public school, for high school for the last two years before I even learned how to do algebra. And then there was uh, science, once again, same thing. Didn't learn biology or anything like that until I got to the high school. Till when I was 16, but I learned critical thinking. I learned a lot about how important it is to look at the information you're given and consider it. Don't really accept it as face value. Look for this inconsistencies. Look for what it means, the implications, the basis, the foundational aspects of it. And the encyclopedia really gave that to me just because I was able to see how things connected and how all of these different parts worked. So I got a good foundation in a lot of different aspects of the world, which I'm super thankful for and has been helping me here, helping me, sorry, helping me here so much at uh, BYU. When I was 16, my parents and I moved to Colorado. Or sorry, my parents and I, my siblings were included in that, obviously. But we all moved to Colorado. Uh, in hot, in Mich Michigan, the rules for truancy are that as long as you have parental approval, you're allowed to, you don't need to be registered with the school. So that's the reason why we were able to do my homeschooling career as we did with the encyclopedias and all of that. But in, Mich in Colorado, the rules were different. The laws were such that if you wanted to do homeschool, you had to homeschool your child, you had to follow the set curriculum of an online school. So my parents came to us and gave us a choice. We, they said, do you want us to homeschool you and to for you to follow these things, or do you want to go into high school? And we all decided to go into high school, um, or to middle school, I think, for my little, for my little sister, one of them. Um, so what we did was we went to high school. 
And all of the, I wanted to go mostly for social interaction. I was 16 at the time. I knew I was going to get my GED more likely than not because our credits couldn't transfer over. I mean, we had this stack of encyclopedia of essays. That was about it. And it wasn't really standardized. It was very hard for them. So what I, I realized that. So I knew I wasn't going to be going in for a diploma. I knew I was going to get my GED. But I was going for social interaction to learn how to interact with people of my own age, to interact with people of my own stat. Um, life ex level of life experience or amount of life experience maybe is a better word to put it. And it was very hard. Uh, I had to deal with learning social cues. I had where all of the experience that people got in elementary school and middle school and the first two years of high school, I had to, I felt like I was playing catch up. I was dealing with a lot of things that I didn't know how to deal with and working through those. Um, for example, as I mentioned in the previous segment, I was the type of guy to kiss a girl's hand after a dance. And I had people who brought that up. And there were other things, a lot of a lot of other things in how I spoke and how I dealt with people. And even now I have a couple of the remnants. Lack of a filter is the way that some people put it. Uh, that I and I don't even I didn't even consider it until I got into high school. But that was what I learned there. Wasn't is I learned algebra. I learned some science, some biology, and stuff like that. But more than anything than not, I learned how to interact with people my own age and how to interact in a manner that wasn't as socially jarring or as embarrassing as it privately was, previously was. It was hard, and it was interesting trying to figure out who I was in this, kind, in this world, in this wider world, but it was definitely worth it. I had always wanted to serve a mission, but because I didn't really start preparing for it, I wasn't ready at the time, and I just kept on pushing it off, especially as my family situation wasn't doing too well. <gasps> at the time, we had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, familial issues, um, both with my parents and with my siblings, and I felt, very, I felt sort of a responsibility to that because as the eldest, I felt that responsibility to what they were doing, and so Rather than deal with that or accept about what they were doing, I ran away from it and cut a lot of, I put a lot of emotional distance to that. And as a result, I sort of went through my own teenage phase of rebellion and I started just delving into the things that I liked and ignoring everything else. Uh, when I, around that time, I got called as a home teacher, which is someone who, um, with a partner, visits the homes of certain members, a list of maybe three or four member families and talks with them, sees how they're doing, reaches out, um, and in general, f just is a support to them when they need it. Uh, one of the families was named the Sperry family. Oh. Beg your pardon. Uh, was the name of the Sperry family, and the mother of the family was named Shauna. She was the Relief Society president and became one of the most important people in my life. She helped me get on a mission. She honestly is the reason I went on. She was there for me when I needed help. She was there as an example for me when I wasn't sure who to look to, especially as everything around me felt like it was crumbling. I reached out and I talked with her and there were many nights where uh, I had to deal with something and I didn't feel like I could talk with my parents, but I could talk with her. And in reality, she's, once again, she's the reason I went on a mission. I can't say how much I respect and I love and I appreciate the relationship I have with Shauna. Even now we still talk and even now she, cons she considers me um, and I consider her family and it's just such an important bond. A, the other, another person who really helped was my bishop at the time. Uh, he was a very, he, he was a very Normally a very quiet, a rather quiet man, someone who tries to help and reach out, but he exemplified the role of a bishop, of a church leader, as I was getting ready. He reached, he did his best to constantly be there for me as, as I was going through this time in my life and as I was trying to get ready for a mission. And he helped out so much. He was there when I was at my lowest. He helped me put, he helped me push back all, all of the things that would be keeping me from a mission all of the insecurities, all of the worries, all of the concerns, and just in general helped me become a better person. And I beg your pardon. And I'm very thankful for his influence in my life.
so as I got ready, I got I pushed, I pushed, I pushed until finally I was able to get everything I needed to for a mission. And there are a couple of miracles along those along with that, but that was basically how everything I got into, everything that I needed got fell into place. As I was getting ready for my mission, I we had a bit of an issue. We needed to move. Uh, in particular, we were being evicted, and we didn't quite know where we were gonna f where we were gonna go for a bit until we found a place uh, with a family friend. The problem was with that family friend is that he didn't have enough space for, uh, at the time, five individuals. Yeah, five individuals. He had the space for maybe four. Um, my mom had already. Uh, Sorry, I probably should clarify this. My mom had, uh, wasn't with us at the time. She had, um, my, family, my parents were, being, were separated at the time. And so my dad was able to live there. And my brother was able to live there. My youngest sister was able to there, live there. But, my, but there was not enough space for both my other sister and I. Um, and so he liked me a lot. And he said, you know what, you should come move in, in with me. And she, Michelle, my sister, had other places to live. She could have. But she wasn't going through the best of times at the time. Uh, and in addition, more th not even more than that, but in addition, I didn't feel like I needed to, I felt like I needed to stay away from living with my family from then on, from a, for a while, especially as I was getting ready. Uh, as, I mentioned, as I've mentioned, the stress of living with my family was a bit of a trial in me getting ready for my mission. Um, but I wasn't quite sure, so I said, I graciously, I graciously said no. I was very thankful for the offer, but I had to say no so that my sister could live there. And so that, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, I, it was coming up to the time where I would need to find a place to live. I was 19, but I didn't have, I didn't, I had a job, but I didn't have nearly enough money to live in Colorado on my own. I didn't have and enough financial stability to live without someone. Um, so, but I wasn't quite sure who I was going to live with. I reached out to my, I reached out to some family members, but um, they weren't quite sure about living, having me live in with them. Um, one of them had, uh, one of my aunts and uncles was someone I was close with. I reached out to them, but they had their own kids, and I'd lived and I'd stayed there for a few days at a time. But living there with, their, with them for months. Was, especially as I was getting ready for a mission, was something that they weren't quite sure if they'd be able to do. So they were trying to figure that out, if they logistically, if they could. I reached out, um, my grandparents heard about my plight. Um, I didn't reach out to them. They had had bad experiences with having people live with them in the past. So I didn't really feel like it was my place to ask. Um, but my family knew about this issue. My extended family knew about this issue. And then finally, um, people in the ward knew about it. But I wasn't worried. Um, how did I put it? There was a phrase that I had, the Lord would provide. And it was something that I was, became a mantra as I was getting ready for a mission, especially as all these things happened. And I, because I had kept on seeing things fall into place. I'd found a job just as I needed to. I had found a, uh, I had gotten everything that I needed to for a mission ready just as I needed it. No, it was a bit last minute sometimes, but as I needed a job, as I needed a play as I needed um, a friend, as I needed anything I needed for a mission or for me to get better, I found it. I, so I, my mantra became the Lord will provide. And I, it was three days before you we were going to be evicted. I still didn't have a place to stay, but I wasn't, I wasn't worried. Um, I knew something would happen. And I was talking with Shauna, uh, the woman who helped, who is the reason I went on a mission, really. Uh, and I was explaining to her, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't. She asked me if I knew where I was going to live, and I said, nope, don't know. She wanted to have me come in, but she had a daughter who was a few years younger than I was, and it wouldn't have been seen as appropriate. Um, so I, and I told, and she was, she was very apologetic about that. She was very sad about that, but she was just like, okay, I'll. I really, I, and I just kept on telling her, yeah, the Lord will provide, I'm fine. And she was just, she was a bit astounded. She told me later that I had said that because she didn't see how I could have that strength. But, and I'm not saying this to boast, uh, to boast, sorry. Let me just clarify. It's just something, that was just sort of the sequence of events.
Um, I didn't really worry about it. It was around three days before, as I said, and we were at a word activity. I felt like I really wanted to stay with the word and stay close to them. Um, and it was something to just take a deep breath as we were packing up our stuff, um, which was very stress. It was, it was a bit, which was a bit stressful. Sorry for slurring. And in the middle of that activity, one of the members of the ward, who I hadn't really talked with, Abim, she uh, said, hey, I heard that you have a problem with someone, you're not able to stay where you're staying, you can come live with me. I had talked with this woman maybe twice, and she was opening her home to me um, because she had heard that I was having a plight. Um, later on that day, I got a call from my grandparents, I got a call from my aunt and uncle, and both of them offered to open their homes to me for however long I needed until the mission. Um, and it, the Lord provided. I stayed with um, a beam and for a few weeks as I was finishing up my job. I didn't feel like it was appropriate for me to just say, to just drop my job and say, okay, I'm moving. I, I stayed with her for the three weeks, for around three weeks, as I continued my job and I wrapped up my affairs in, mon in my monument, and then I moved in with my, um, my old ward, sorry, my old city, and then I moved in with my grandparents, which was a special experience. Um, and I could have a full video about my, living with my grandparents, but the point I really wanted to point out here is that I wasn't worried because I knew that the Lord was always there for me. I knew what I was doing was right. I had no doubt about it. And I knew that if I was going to go forward, um, that something would happen, something would fall through. And some might say that was a bit negligent of me, saying oh, I should have been doing a lot more. There wasn't much. I was doing everything I could. I wasn't in a position where I had much control, and I realized that. I was trying to stay afloat. I was trying to do everything I could, but I also realized I couldn't stay with my family. I couldn't stay with my parents. And I really felt like I needed to get out if I was going to go on a mission. And I was able to. So the, sort of the moral story is, if you're doing what you know you need to do, just keep pushing forward and trust that something will go along. And if it's not the right thing, don't worry, you'll find out. Don't worry, you'll be knocked off course soon enough. And you'll find something else. Find where you need to go. When I was a kid, I loved... Japan. I grew up with my mom's stories of her sister Norie, who was a foreign exchange student who came to live with her parents and her when she was younger. And when I was homeschooled, one of the outlets I had among video, other than video games for my boredom was anime. I loved watching, learning about these stories. I loved Dragon Ball Z, I loved Yu-Gi-Oh! and then Naruto and all these other um, stories as I was growing up. I just, it was something I really enjoyed uh, seeing and watching. It's just a form of entertainment that I really enjoyed. And as a result, I, um, as I grew up and as I started learning more and started getting slightly bored of anime, I, found, I started seeing some patterns actually in those anime and looking them up. I started finding out about um, the culture of Japan. I started looking into what exactly Japan was and what was so different about them. Why it, it was such a foreign place. Japan was seen as such a, an opposite place to America in a lot of regards. And I wanted to learn about it. So I started learning about it and I fell in love with it. I f or maybe I fell in like with it is a better way to put it. I loved the place. I loved looking at it. I liked all these different aspects and I really wanted to look about, learn about it. Fesh, uh, flash forward to when I was going to a mission and applying and submitting my papers. I got accepted. I got my papers and um, I was submitted and I was waiting on my mission call. Um, I knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to Japan, but I also knew that the chances of me going were very slim. But I wasn't emotionally ready at the time for that. Uh, I had a lot of times where I was praying and I said, Heavenly Father, I just want to love my mission. I, it wasn't that I, I wanted to go to Japan, I knew that, but more than anything, I wanted to love my mission. I wanted to look at my um, mission papers and say, I will love this place. And there were a couple of places in particular which I could have been called to because of my history with them, um, like Michigan, for example, that 
I felt like I might be called to and I wouldn't, I'd be frustrated, I'd be resentful and I didn't want that. So there were many times, many nights where I was praying and saying, Heavenly Father, please give me the strength to, no, help, not even just give me the strength, give me the love of my mission. I, please bless me with the love of my mission as soon as I see the name. And I did this for a, a few, a couple of weeks, um, both before I submitted my papers and after. And there's this one time, um, it was a couple of days before I got my call. Uh, and I was just, I was walking outside. And I was saying, Heavenly Father, and I was thinking about this. I was walking over to a friend's house and I said, Heavenly Father, I know you love me. And I know I will love my mission. But please let me love my mission as soon as I see it. As soon as I see the name, let me love it. And I got this feeling and I got this understanding that I was going to love my mission. And the way I understood it at the time, the feeling I understood at the time was that I got my blessing. And in the way I did, um, I knew I was going to love it and I was so thankful and my heart was content. Fast forward a couple of weeks, I got my mission call. Um, and I got the package and it was, we were all guessing and I was surrounded by my family and I looked at, and it comes in an envelope and I was the type, I wasn't the type of person, I didn't know any of these, once again, I'm the first person in my mission, uh, the first person in my family to go on a mission, not counting extended family, but I didn't know any of the, the cultural things, I didn't know any of these little tricks like hiding the name and reading it line by line. So when I opened the paper up, I opened it up and I looked straight down to where my mission was. Um, I still have the video and I got choked up and I instantly remembered that moment back when I was walking outside to a friend's house and that answer I got. Because as soon as I looked at my mission, I knew I loved it. And it was Japan. It was Japan Sapporo. And I got called to the Japan Sapporo mission. And I got choked up for just a second and I started reading it and everyone freaked out as soon as I said where I was getting called because everyone knew I wanted to get called to Japan and no one gets called to the dream mission. No one does. Everyone loves their mission. They get called to the dream, they, sorry, they get called to the dream mission. They just don't realize it's their dream mission until afterwards. Um, but I got, I got called to it and I knew that Heavenly Father was very aware of who I was and what I loved and, uh, and I was so appreciative of it. Um, during my mission, though, this caused a, a couple of issues just because I was worried that, oh, maybe I got called to the wrong place. Maybe I got called to this place and by mistake because I said that I had a little bit of Japanese experience, which I did. Maybe I got called to this and somehow I tricked an apostle of the Lord into calling me where I, needed to, where I wanted to go rather than where I was needed. Maybe I'm not sufficient enough for this calling. And those kinds of worries pushed me for, um, pushed me down for a long time, actually. Um, throughout my mission, I was always having those worries because I got called exactly where I wanted to. And I was wondering if maybe I had tricked the system somehow. <laughs> I was a bit of an arrogant, I was a little bit arrogant uh, for that. But um, I was listening to a general conference talk one day. Uh, I was at work and just cleaning tables. And it was a talk by um, Elder Bednar. And what he said was, um, he was talking about missions and how we are called to serve missions and we are assigned to areas. And we're assigned no matter, and we're assigned to an area where we will be able to help. And I could have been, and the answer came to me that I could have been assigned anywhere. I was called to serve a mission and the Lord set up everything that, need, that I needed for on that mission. I could have been called somewhere else and it would have been my dream mission. It would have been exactly where I needed to be, but the Lord knew where I wanted to go. And I knew that the Lord wanted me to enjoy my mission and he wanted me to be happy. So he guided his apostle to call me where I got called, to get called to my dream mission. And this influenced me so much. It wasn't because I needed to necessarily be there. There were other, he could have had other people do it, but he chose me to be able to help those people. And to more than anything else, to, to build me and to have that trust.
When I got that answer, everything clicked into place, and I've never looked back. I got called to my dream mission because that's where I needed to be. That was where I needed to be to grow, to push past my insecurities, to push past my worries. And I got blessed that it was, enough, that it was also the place that I wanted to go. When I got out of my mission, I realized that my testimony was a little bit narrow. I had a testimony of Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father was someone I had a very close relationship with, I felt, and I trusted him. When I said the Lord would provide in my heart, I was really saying Heavenly Father will provide. Um, but as far as J Jesus Christ and understanding who Jesus Christ was to me and understanding who Joseph Smith was, three of the things that um, we really testify of in strength, um, it was very hard for me just because I didn't feel like I had a close connection to either of those two, mentally or, emotion or spiritually. Um, but as I went through my mission, I was able to build my testimony of that. I, in particular, two experiences come to mind. One is with Joseph Smith. I was learning the first vision, the account that Joseph Smith had of him seeing Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ appear to him. And I was speaking in Japanese. Um, I was reciting in Japanese because I knew I needed to learn it um, in order to recite it. My Japanese was not all that good. Uh, Learning the language in and of itself was an experience, but I was reciting it, just, um, just stating it over and over, um, over and over and over, um, and I remembered reciting it. Even now, I can I can't recite the uh, first vision in English, but I can recite it in Japanese because of that. Um, Sorry, I, as I was th saying, I learned it, and I was learning it this one time, um, reciting it, and I finally, finally got it. Uh, and I started reciting it. And as I spoke the words in Japanese, which I still didn't understand the word, the meaning of at all, I got this feeling. And I started crying in the middle of me speaking. And I was just like, am I crazy? Am I insane? What am I doing? But I got this sudden, but I got this feeling and this understanding that what I was saying was true. Even if I didn't understand it, I knew it was true. And I read it in English and I read it in Japanese and I knew it was true. And from then on, I realized that Joseph Smith was a prophet. It was just, and it wasn't even a big realization to me. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, he's a prophet. It was the understanding that yeah, the, all of the things that you've been building up of this is just one other part. And you knew, you knew that this was all true, so here's all the foundational things. Here's just another solid piece of foundation, another testimony builder, as it were. And I was very thankful for that. Um, the second part that happened with the second event that really happened was, um, was with Jesus Christ. I... Uh, it wasn't, maybe event is the wrong word, it was a build-up. Um, as I was on my mission, one of the things I had, once again, the issue with was, who is Jesus Christ to me? And slowly but surely, I re came to realize what exactly it meant by the Jesus Christ is the Father. Um, what exactly that meant was, to, was that I, was that they both are one in purpose. And we say that, but what it really means is that they are not the same people, but they are both striving for the same thing. They're both striving for that connection, that for us to come back to them. And they love us infinitely. And I realized that the, I'd been praying to the Father in Jesus Christ's name. And, they came, and I understood that Jesus Christ was the one who was helping me survive, was helping me push through, was helping me become a better person. And when that finally clicked and when that finally built up, and that was a very much a far more drawn out process, I realized that Jesus Christ was my Savior. He was our Savior. He is our Savior. And He helps us through all these different things to the point that I realized that I could testify of it. And I could share my experience with it in all confidence, knowing that it was true. So it wasn't exactly the most... I had two wonderful experiences two very different, vastly different experiences when I built up my testimony, but 
both were this both were different ways both were necessary and both helped me become who I am and we might get one answer in, an answer in one way or we might get an answer in another but either way the foundation will be there when I was younger I said the Lord would provide I um I relied on that that promise that the Lord would provide for me whatever I needed uh, as I was getting ready for my mission and then as I was on my mission as I continued on through my mission that promise was just once more and more reinforced and I just kept on feeling it more and more as I learned about Joseph Smith as Jesus, of Jesus Christ of the fun of Heavenly Father of the foundational elements of the Holy Ghost of the gospel I gained more and more of a testimony That's not to say it was easy. That's not to say I didn't have doubts. I didn't have questions. I didn't have concerns. Things I don't, didn't understand. Th there are still things I don't understand. And I think that's the thing that scares me the most is that there are still things that I don't understand and I'm still worried about. But I also have the reassurance that what I do know, I do know. I know that Jesus Christ is our Savior. I know the Heavenly Father is our Father, our literal Father, our literal, our literal spiritual Father. He created us. He loves us as a Father does perfectly. I know that the Holy Ghost guides us and protects us, strengthens us when we need it, and is there whenever we need a helping hand. I know that Jesus Christ, once again, is our brother. And he loves us and cares for us just as much as Heavenly Father. And he reaches out for us and it truly did sacrifice himself. It's hard sometimes for people to trust. I know that because it's hard for me to trust. But when we push forward and we take that leap of faith, He will be there. Jesus Christ is our Lord. We are His disciples. 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 We are His disciples.神様、いや、イエスキリスト様、いや。その、生で、もう大変なことがあるかもしれませんが、辛いことや、いろんなものがあるかもしれませんが、イエスキリストさまが、に信頼していて、向かい向かったら必ず を崩されることができるだろうかと確信します。最後まで大使の仏とができるだろうかと確信します。イエスキリスト様と神様と聖霊が私たちを愛しています。このすべて愛する恩子イエスキリスト様の身の音としてお明かしします。アーメン。Some missionaries have a lot of success. They, a lot of tangible success is probably a better way to put it. They have tons of mission, they have tons of mission stories, they have a lot of um, baptisms, they have a lot of leadership callings, and it's so many different things going on. And they can say, these are the 20 things I did on my mission, and these are the things that, that I changed. Other missionaries are the opposite. They have 
maybe they may have no leadership um, experience. They may have had maybe trained, maybe, maybe not. They might have not even seen a baptism. I was born in the second category. I trained twice, which was such a wonderful experience. I was very happy. But I didn't, I had always, well, I had always wanted to be like the assistant, to always push myself to become the best in just a small secret part of my heart. Sorry about that. Uh, I didn't ever get that. I became a district leader, which I was so grateful for, though. Um, but anyways, more on that in a the, in the second. The point I'm trying to get at is that we always have these different things, these tangible and intangible benefits that happened. And it's very hard for some missionaries to come back and feel like, oh my gosh, that was actually a success. When I got back, I, had been, I felt like I wasn't really a success. And it was just um, magnified when I came and I saw that no real change had happened in my family. My family hadn't been doing the best and I felt like I hadn't, and I had been praying for them, and, but they came, I came back and I felt like they were the same. And I was a bit frustrated at that and very saddened by that. And I felt like maybe my mission hadn't really meant, meant as much to others. At least I had changed, but what was the point for others? Um, I talked with my brother after this um, more recently, and what he, and he's now um, he's getting ready for his endowment. He uh, was inactive, and now he's getting ready for his endowment, and he's he's at BYUI and working on becoming who he wants to be and pushing you forward. And he talked with me, and I talked with him a little bit of, oh, a while back, and I said, Justin, this is great. I'm so happy for you. What changed this cause? In your, what changed this? And what made you really want to do this? And he just looked at me and said, You did. And I was just like, what are you talking about, Justin? And he said, your mission was great. And I was so proud of you for doing what you always wanted to do and what I always wanted to do and reaching out and put me, paving that path. And then when you came back and, and when you came back, I realized that I needed to shape up. And that's so many words he said. And he said that he needed to shape up and that he wanted to do better. So he did, and he pushed forward, and he, it was based on my example when I was on my mission. And when I had that happen, I realized my prayers had been answered. Those things that I'd been wanting to happen, happened. And those changes that I wanted to happen, happened. Not all of them, and it's not an ideal world, but he reached out, Justin, my brother, Someone who I was honestly quite worried, I was really worried for, pushed out. I didn't find that out until almost two, maybe a year and a half after my mission, after all this had happened. <sighs> there were tons of other effects on my mission that came from my mission. The changes in me I'm still finding. And I'm still dealing with things. I'm still pushing through, and I'm not perfect. But I look back on my mission, and I realize it was a success, not because of the tangible benefits, but because of the things that changed, the things, that the effects, the ripples. For lack of a better phrase, the butterfly effect. I touched one thing, but so many other things changed, and the Lord's in control of that. He knows exactly what I'm going to do. He knew exactly what I was going to say and how successful, successful in reaching other people I would be. And he knew where I needed to be when I needed to be it, there. So my message to all of you is to don't feel like if your mission wasn't perfect or that you didn't have all these different methods of success that you were a failure. Don't ever feel that way because you don't know the effect your mission had on other people. I saw some, The only time I saw someone close to me change, the only time I realized that the effect that I had on that was over a year later. There's some, we won't see the effects of our mission until well into the, etern until the eternities. But trust that the Lord knew where he was sending you. And in all aspects of life, trust that you do have an effect wherever you go. Because you do. You are important. And that's the most important thing to remember, is that you are worth it. And that you, did, you are doing, you are having an effect on the world around you. And if you're pushing forward and doing what you need to, then that's the most important thing. As I, um, after getting back from my mission, um, 
it's actually kind of funny uh, in a kind of dark humor way. Uh, I really wanted to get an extension, but I didn't feel right in asking for one properly. I probably could have gotten one for 30 days. I probably could have pushed it out for a month, but I was coming back in January 7th around thereabouts. Could have pushed it back before Christmas, but I felt like I really wanted to have my last Christmas and New Year's in Japan. So that's what I did. I filled it, finished out the tent transfer properly. Um, Pro properly isn't the right word, maybe, but I, um, when I was leaving, I was emotional, but I wasn't crying. Um, I had all my stuff. I was surrounded by friends, by family, by people who became family, and I loved it. And I was so blessed. I was able to see um, the Kageyama family before I left. They came to the mission home and said bye to me. And I was so thankful. I was touched in a way that I was very grateful and I didn't want to leave. Um, as I was going, but as I, I got, I left, of course. And I was coming home and I came home on my own. Um, I wasn't with I, was, I mean, there were a couple of missionaries, obviously, but we also, in our separate ways, come, I think, San Fran, San Francisco, maybe, but or Japan. I, I don't think I was sitting next to a missionary companion. And I was just dealing with it. I was just pushing along, and I thought it was okay. But when as soon as I came, got off the plane, and came to into Denver, and was coming up the stairs, and I saw my dad, I cried. And I think a lot of them thought, wow, he's coming back and he's so happy to see us. It wasn't quite that. Um, I was, I just realized that it was over and I didn't want it to be over. My mission meant so much to me. It changed my life. It changed where I was going. And dealing with the after effects of no longer feeling like you have as much of a purpose, of no longer feeling like you're doing what you need to, of no longer having that guidance, it was very hard. Um, but I, I was very thankful, of course, to see my dad, very thankful to see my family. And it felt like in a lot of ways that no time had passed at all. My little, except for my little sister, she would grown up like a weed. Um, I, we compared pictures and she had grown at least six inches. It felt like, at least that's what it felt like. But, and she had grown into a young woman from when she was a little girl. Um, but I came up and went through. Then I went and I cried and I cried and I cried. My last transfer basically was a lot of crying actually, come to think of it. Uh, I could count the amount of times that I had cried on, in my entire life on both hands and had a couple of fingers over that I could remember. I wasn't the type of to, to cry before my mission or even during my mission. It was only at my last transfer and after that I started just having the waterworks come in and that feeling. Um, but I, uh, as I was saying, I came back and I had to deal with being back from a mission. The first month was, I was, so I lived with my aunt and uncle uh, there. And the first month I was really just adjusting. It was a very strenuous process. But I was adjusting and working through things. Um, but then I, and I wasn't quite sure where I was going to go with life. But then I got, oh. Beg your pardon, a kick in the rear as it was, and I got told, "Hey, you need to go on. A, you need to get working." And I was just like, "Okay, I'll get a job. Fine." And they were like, "Okay." Uh, a couple of weeks go by. Did you find a job? No. Did you find a job? No. Finally, someone, one of my aunt was talking with someone in the ward, and she knew says, "Yeah, we're looking for someone to hire for a construction job." And she says, "Well," she said, "Well, I have my cousin. I have my uh, nephew living with us right now. Come in, and he can work." She was just like, wonderful, have him apply. Have him send his paperwork. And she said, yep, I have you a job. You're going to find a job or you're going to take this one. And I was just like, you know what, I'll take this one. And it was construction. And I was working anywhere between um, 30 to 60 hours a week, um, depending, on the, uh, depending on the week, obviously, depending on the weather and stuff like that. And I was able to adjust. I was forced to really focus on a lot more of the, um, the mundane stuff, a lot of the things, and getting used to being on my own, um, not having a companion, 
having to adjust to interacting with people my own age, not for, and actually having to flirt with girls and go on dates, um, stuff like that. And it was just an adjustment period, but I got it. And it was such a blessing to get that, to get that job is because I pushed myself through. And everyone has their own methods of coping. Everyone has their own ways of getting through. And some people are easier than others. It took me around, I'd say around four months before I was finally comfortable in not being on a mission anymore. Um, but it was, the adjustment period is different from everyone. And it takes some getting used to in different ways. Everyone has their own coping mechanisms. But do what you need to. Figure out what you need to, because the mission isn't the be-all and end-all. It is a big part of your life. It's a big step. But just like there's childhood, just like there's college, just as, like there's marriage life, each, for every time, there's, everything, there's a time and a place. And the mission, when it's over, it's over. And you can go back eventually, and you can go visit. And that's what I did. I was very blessed to be able to visit again six months later because of that job, actually. I had enough money to pay for a plane ticket to go back out to, um, to, go back out to Japan and see the temple dedication in Sapporo and to see some of the people, to see so many of the people I was able, that touched me. Uh, and it was different. I wasn't a missionary anymore and it didn't feel like I was, but it felt like I was still close to them. And that was the important thing. And I'm so thankful for that. So don't feel like it's the end of the world. It feels like it is the end of the world, and in some ways it is. But realize that there's another world coming, and you're going to be adjusting to it just as much as you adjusted to the mission, but it'll be worth it. Just for on a whim, I put out my um, application to all three BYUs, uh, and I got accepted to all three BYUs. I wanted to go to BYU Hawaii because of the Japanese background and because of the strong ties to that, but, um, and I never had wanted to go to BYU or Provo. Ever. Too many Mormons. My image of it was just like, I don't want to deal with this. Maybe I'll go to BYUI, but even then, mm, I had BYU Hawaii. I mean, Hawaii. Why not? Um, but I thought about it, and I was just like, okay, what am I doing? Um, what am I going to do? And I wanted to go to Hawaii, but I kept on getting this nagging feeling. And I was just like, what the heck? Why am I doing this? Why? Father, why are you trying to guide me away from Hawaii? I want to go. But he, I kept on getting guided, and I was just like, what do you expect me to do, Provo? And I was just like, really? Really? Provo? And I was really, um, uh, what's the word? I was really troubled. There's, it's I, Japanese. Um, there's, I was always, I was a bit confused on where I wanted to go. I was really um, deep in thought about it. And I was talking to Shauna, one of the, one, a very important person in my life. She's the reason I got on a mission, actually. Uh, and she said, you know what? You should just go check out the BYU campus. Try, take a flight out or drive out. Um, you have a mission. And I had a mission reunion then as well, so it worked out really well. And go see what it's like. And I was just like, you know what? I'll do that. So I drove out, and I took a tour of the campus with her daughter, um, Aubrey with Shauna's daughter, Aubrey, and she showed me around and she said, this is what it's like and it's, I love it and it's a lot of, it's a great experience. And I thought about it and I was just like, you know what, I think I'm gonna do this. I went out to the missionary union and I was just like, and I uh, found out that a lot of people there at the mission union, a lot of my friends went to BYU and I even ran into uh, someone who was uh, a re an RA, a residence assistant, who handled housing in the place. And I said, hey, where are you living? I'm just like, he says, I'm living here. Do you want, I have, and there are new places nearby where I live. Do you want to come in? And I'll make sure you're in the same ward. I was just like, sure. And I got my answer. It, I don't know exactly why I'm supposed to be at BYU, but I know that this is where I'm supposed to be. Even though I'm not in Hawaii with the beautiful waves, the beautiful water, and the beautiful weather. Oh. That would have been great, especially as if it's been cold. Um, I know I'm exactly where I need to be.